So I'd like to welcome everyone to today's seminar. Dr. Ryan Stowe from Michigan State University um, is a candidate for a faculty position in chemical education in our department. Ryan got his bachelor's degree from Albion College in Michigan, PhD in 2016 from Scripps Research Institute in Florida, where he worked with William Rausch. His dissertation has three sections. Two have to do with organic chemistry. I'm not sure I can pronounce them. And one had to do with use of in silico screening in secondary school classrooms. So that's an interesting combination of things. But we've had a number of graduate students here doing similar types of pieces with a chemical education component. In 2015, he was the Christine Mirzian Science and Technology Policy Fellow at the National Academy of Sciences. In 2016, he moved to a postdoctoral position at Michigan State University with Melanie Cooper, and he's going to talk to us about moving beyond critical thinking, supporting and assessing three-dimensional learning in high school and college. Ryan? There we go. Am I on? I've got a Batman belt, so... That's probably why I'm moving clumsily. Um, thank you, John, for the kind introduction. Thank you, um, committee who approved my invitation. Thanks to everyone I've met today, students and faculty. I've had a wonderful day so far, and I look forward to having another wonderful day tomorrow. So this talk is going to be in two fairly distinct parts. The first will focus on higher education, both on parameterizing, assessing, and supporting things that fall under the umbrella of critical thinking, and also on an ongoing institutional transformation effort, of which I'm a part at Michigan State University. The second part will still main, maintain focus on three-dimensional learning, which I'll uh, define in just a bit, uh, but will shift a bit to high school chemistry, where I'm leading some work. Some of you looking at this title slide and looking at the flyers may well wonder, well, why would we want to move beyond critical thinking? I thought critical thinking was great. Critical thinking is in all sorts of different publications as a desirable outcome of education. And indeed, you would not be alone in supposing this. There have been a number of high-profile National Academy reports that talk about how critical thinking is a vital cognitive skill for both personal and national success in the 21st century. And in fact, I agree with this entirely. The issue, though, as we'll see in just a bit, is sometimes it's a bit challenging to define exactly what critical thinking is. This is one of several definitions I'm going to walk you through, but I'll give you a second to read it and then see if I can read expressions on your faces as to whether you approve or not. Okay, so that was unsuccessful from my perspective because I, I can't read you well. But that's okay. Let's walk through a few points. It sounds pretty good, right? Because it involves cognitive skills and strategies. But are those really the same thing? What defines strategy? What defines a skill? Well, surely we want to increase the probability of a desirable outcome. I guess. Who's desirable outcome? Who defines it? How do you measure it? I, I'm not sure. Uh, it's also involved in solving problems and formulating inferences, calculating likelihoods, and making decisions. All things that, you know, we want students to be able to do, but that's a lot of stuff. That's a lot in one definition, right? Let's look at a few others. It's reflective and reasonable thinking that is focused on deciding what to believe or do. Okay, cool. Uh, we want students, I think, to slow down and see if all of the many claims they're bombarded with gel with the evidence that they're presented and really um, think whether those are united by sound reasoning, certainly. The second one talks about a, a willingness to test the validity of propositions. This is kind of a disposition. This is a habitual tendency to be skeptical and to think, well, what supports this claim that's being made? As it turns out, there is little evidence that critical thinking is a distinct domain general construct apart from general cognitive ability. There's a number of tests that purport to measure critical thinking, and as it turns out, they correlate less among themselves than they do with tests of general cognitive ability. It is a better argument to think 
of the many skills that might fall under the umbrella of critical thinking as domain general, I'm sorry, as domain specific skills rather than domain general. For instance, many of you in this room have, probably all of you in this room, have areas of chemistry about which you're very, very good at evaluating the validity of claims, at analyzing and interpreting data, at constructing explanations. But that doesn't mean that you would be equally good at doing that same sort of thing about, for instance, world economic policy. Maybe some of you are, but I certainly would not be, which is why I picked that example. Also importantly, we cannot assess what we cannot define. And if we can't assess it, we can't know whether we're supporting it. So if critical thinking is something that we value, is a sort of outcome or a series of nested outcomes that we want for our students, we have to figure out a way to define it precisely. A way that I will propose, and that was put forth in a relatively recent consensus study, is something called three-dimensional learning. So in 2012, the National Research Council convened a study section of experts in teaching and learning and numerous domains, including chemistry, and thought about research on how people learn and what teaching and learning in science should look like for the K-12 through space. They articulated a vision that says science education shouldn't just be about knowing stuff, but rather should be about building, refining, and critiquing knowledge in classroom communities. It should be about using that knowledge to make sense of phenomena. This is articulated by fusing core ideas, scientific practices, and cross-cutting concepts. And I'm going to go into a bit more detail on what those are in just a bit. Although the framework for K-12 science education is geared towards the K-12 space, as is obvious in its name, the literature that underpins it is equally applicable to higher education. So what are these three dimensions? Disciplinary core ideas are not simply topics. They're larger in grain size and should pervade the entirety of a curriculum. And in fact, the next-gen science standards, which are based on the framework, argue that they should pervade the entirety of the K-12 curriculum for particular disciplines. These are four ideas that a group of people at Michigan State University identified as core to chemistry. And you'll notice that, for instance, there isn't just a chapter on energy in any general chemistry class, but rather you should be thinking about energy when you're considering phenomena from two helium, atom, helium atoms approaching each other and considering uh, how the potential and kinetic energy change to thinking about um, intermolecular forces for water molecules, dissolution, and indeed the causality behind chemical reactions. Scientific practices represent the sorts of things we want students to be able to do with their knowledge. This can be thought of as the disaggregated components of inquiry, and these are more precisely defined than things like inquiry or problem solving. These include things like constructing arguments from evidence, constructing explanations, analyzing and interpreting data, um, communicating and evaluating information. Many of these uh, scientific practices have a rich scholarship underpinning them that very precisely defines what they look like in classroom context. The third of the three dimensions is the cross-cutting concepts. And the idea behind the cross-cutting concepts was to talk about certain things in consistent ways across disciplines to convey to students that there's unity across scientific inquiry, that it's not so siloed. Now, when you look at the cross-cutting concepts, you may think, as I have, wait, aren't some of those not really concepts? I mean, when we think about patterns, are we after the definition that patterns are observed regularities, or are we after students really analyzing data, seeing patterns, and using that to support claims? If you have that particular critique, I agree with you. The cross-cutting concepts are a little bit of a mixed bag. We can talk about it later if you want. There are still ongoing discussions about what exactly they are. But I think the disciplinary core ideas and the scientific practices provide a nice framework to think about knowledge and use. Three-dimensional learning is not simply knowing stuff and then doing inquiry, but rather it's about the use of this knowledge to predict, explain, and model ever more complex phenomena as you go throughout a curriculum. As an example of what a performance expectation that integrates these three dimensions might look like, I pulled up this performance expectation from the Next Generation Science Standards, which, as I said, were derived from the framework for K-12 science education. You can see that students are to plan and conduct an investigation, one of the practices, to gather evidence in order to compare the structure of substances at the bulk scale, by which they mean phase, that's worded clumsily, but I didn't write it, so I apologize, um, to infer the strength of electrical forces between particles. 
So here we want students to be thinking about the fact that things that have different melting or boiling points have different melting or boiling points because there are different strengths of attractive electrostatic interactions that hold them together and that energy is required to disrupt these interactions. Thereby, we're drawing on several of the core ideas I mentioned on the last slide. Cross-cutting concept here is patterns, and that's probably because students are analyzing and interpreting the data that they derive from their investigation, and so they're looking for observed regularities to help support their conclusions. When we think about supporting this kind of knowledge in use, we really should draw on literature related to how people learn. In particular, the differences between expert and novice knowledge, and, and we should think about where our students are on that continuum. Hint, it's not expert as you know. Expert knowledge is characterized by being really very organized. Concepts that are related to each other in a way that enables experts to predict or explain things are apparent to experts. And when a particular context arises, experts can cohere those fragments together and issue a reasonable argument, explanation, model, etc. Novice knowledge is far more fragmented. It's far less organized. It's far less contextualized. So a novice may see two scenarios that to an expert may seem very closely related and give very, very different responses that seem idiosyncratic. Those result from the fact that the things that the novice was cued in to grab onto and coordinate the knowledge fragments they were bringing together in their answer were not informed by a deep expert-like organized knowledge structure. They were kind of a grab bag of whatever seemed intuitively useful at the time. And as I'm sure you know, our macroscopic experience very often can lead us astray when applied to the world of atoms and molecules. To help novices develop expertise, to develop an intellectual toolkit useful for reasoning about things that are counterintuitive, it may be useful to have progressions of these core ideas that start with fairly simple systems, such as the two helium atoms approaching and considering uh, how the potential and kinetic energy change, and then build slowly up to more complex systems as students are engaged in making these connections and using their knowledge to think about things that eventually will be relatable to them. So what evidence is there for how we can support three-dimensional learning in chemistry? As I mentioned, chemistry has the unique challenge of asking students to ground their reasoning in things that behave in very counterintuitive sorts of ways. And so the intuition derived from wandering about the macroscopic world is very often not particularly productive when applied to problems in chemistry. One idea that's been used with some success by Melanie Cooper and colleagues at Michigan State University and Clemson is to have a curriculum that explicitly is tied to sequences of these core ideas that are elaborated as students predict, explain, and model ever more complex phenomena. This is in recognition of the fact that students have very few intellectual resources useful in reasoning about atoms and molecules at the outset of a course. And so you have to start simple. I told many of the people that I met with today that there are those that propose starting a high school chemistry course with ammonium chloride dissolving in water and noting that the beaker gets cold. That's really quite complex if you don't know anything about energy or electrostatics or electrons or what molecules are. That might be a little bit too ambitious of a jumping off point, even if ultimately it will be tractable. This curriculum that Melanie and colleagues have developed and continue to refine is called Chemistry, Life, the Universe, and Everything. There's a little website there. Uh, to get a little bit of a sense as to what a scaffolded progression of core ideas might look like, I'll show you one here, which it will just animate wholly. There we go. That's better. So as I've mentioned with the two helium atom example, bonding and energetics are introduced early in the course and explicitly refined over and over again before students think at all about chemical reactions. Physical properties are then introduced as they relate to forces between and within molecules. This is of course related to molecular structure and an understanding that the structure occurs in three dimensions. Although, and I think John used a similar progression he mentioned yesterday, Three-dimensional structures are kind of hard to draw initially for students who have no exposure doing that. So this creates a need for a two-dimensional cartoon, for a Lewis structure. But since this Lewis structure drawing has occurred after discussion of bonding and energetics, the hope is that it means more to students than simply a skill to be learned because it's question 12 on the exam. Once Lewis structure drawing has been situated in this progression, students then transition back to three dimensions with new formalisms and more complex structures are introduced. Remember, there has been focus in the curriculum before this on forces between and within 
uh, molecules. And so students can consider how charge distribution is impacted by effective nuclear charge of atoms bonded together. Because of that, Lewis structures are not simply a meaningless cartoon, but rather a model vested with meaning, grounded in core ideas. And so this should enable students to use them to predict properties. To get a sense as to whether situating Lewis structure drawing in this progression enables students to better represent forces between molecules, I'm going to quickly present a study to you that Melanie did a number of years ago. In this question, students are asked to draw a representation that clearly indicates where the hydrogen bonding is present for three molecules of ethanol. Everyone in this room is looking at this going, this is dead easy, no problem, everyone should be able to do this, right? I mean, I'm sure that's a common sentiment. It certainly was to me the first time I read the study. This is a system called B-Socratic. It allows free-form drawing for students in terms of formative assessments, and we can play it back, which is kind of neat. This student did a pretty good job. Student drawings to that, in answer to that question could be categorized in one of three ways. They could draw hydrogen bonds and indicate them as within a molecule. So here they're indicating them as, as a covalent bond, the OH bond. They could do what we hope they're going to do and draw them as interactions between molecules, or they could just do something we can't make heads or tails of. Everyone, everyone sympathizes. Uh, the same coding scheme, the same set of descriptors can apply to dipole-dipole interactions in London dispersion forces. And I don't think you need any reminder, but of course we're after the middle. So how do students do? These are matched cohorts of students taught using a, a curriculum structured according to a well-precedented sequence of topics, and then clue students. They're at the same institution. Both cohorts of students scored at about the 70th percentile on the ACS Gen Chem exam. So these are pretty good students. No, horrified gas? No? Nothing? Okay. A little bit horrified gas for me the first time I saw this. We can see that nearly 80% of students were drawing hydrogen bonds as within molecules. They're, they're depicting these things as covalent bonds. I should mention that pretty much all these students can give you a textbook definition of a hydrogen bond. This has been replicated, and it's been replicated many more times besides this. Gratifyingly, the crew enrolled students, and they're matched according to demographic information, uh, drew hydrogen bonds as between molecules uh, in over 80%. And they also overwhelmingly depicted dipole-dipole and London dispersion forces as between molecules. So that's pretty cool. But can they use them to explain differences in properties? We're going to return to that near the end of the talk. It's been replicated as well. Forgot about that part. Okay, so we've talked a little bit about how we might define critical thinking and how we really need to define critical thinking if we want to assess it and if we want to support it. We've also talked a little bit about how we might think about supporting things that fall under the umbrella of critical thinking in chemistry. But we can't know that we're supporting these things unless we actually can find a way to elicit evidence that students can use their knowledge. So what that entails is defining exactly what you want students to know and be able to do. This is why the three dimensions of three-dimensional learning are useful. The scientific practices are a precise way to define what we want students to be able to do with their knowledge. We then have to think about what evidence we would accept that students can do the sorts of things that we value, that we've expressed in our performance expectations. Then we finally have to design a task that elicits that evidence. This is a deceptively simple slide for what is objectively a really hard set of problems. Something that's been helpful at Michigan State University for helping to guide construction of tasks that have the potential to engage students in knowledge and use is up here called the three-dimensional learning assessment protocol. What this protocol does is specify criteria that an item would have to meet to have the potential to elicit evidence of engagement in a practice, that's the use of knowledge, a core idea, and a cross-cutting concept. You start out with a scientific practice when you use this protocol, and there are a set of criteria that all assessment items that um, and have the potential to engage students in that practice must fulfill. And so this is for developing and using models, and you can see that there's a particular thing to model. That's one of the criteria. They should construct a representation, but then they should use that representation as they predict or explain what's going on. If they don't do the prediction or the explanation and link that to their representation with reasoning, which is that category four, then it's just a picture. You don't know that it's being leveraged for any sort of sense making. Is there a core idea? If so, which one? So the three-dimensional learning assessment protocol was developed for undergraduate courses, and so the core ideas are ones that were arrived at through consensus department, uh, consensus discussions rather, with individuals in the department. 
And then is there a cross-cutting concept? Candidly, of course, of course, I'm being recorded, so it's not that candid. Um, I have never seen an assessment item that has a core idea and a scientific practice that does not also have a cross-cutting concept. I'm so fond of these cross-cutting concepts, you can see. So what does this look like? How can we use this as a tool to take a, a fairly traditional task that doesn't have any sort of request for student reasoning and modify it to have the potential to engage students in knowledge and use? Before I go on, I should be very, very clear that potential to elicit evidence of knowledge and use does not mean guaranteed to elicit evidence of student knowledge and use. Whether or not it will actually cue students into what we're asking for is an empirical question. You've got to sit down with students and see if they understand what it is you're asking. So, this is a chestnut. This is the chestnut E2 question. It's on a lot of exams. And indeed, it fulfills many of the criteria of the three-dimensional learning assessment protocol. There is a phenomenon. Students are asked to construct a representation and predict the product. But we don't really know if reasoning is guiding this. Remember when I showed you Be Socratic and how we could play back student drawings? It turns out, if you ask students to draw a mechanism and predict the product, a good number of students actually draw the product and then decorate it with arrows afterwards. Because that's how they memorized it and that's how they're retrieving that knowledge from their memory. They're not using the arrows as predictive tools and in fact, were you to ask them, they would not really know what the arrows meant. So they're not a model. If we ask for some sort of explanation for the rationale for the regiochemistry of the product that was drawn, we have a little bit of a chance at getting at the reasoning that underpins their product prediction. Again, there's no guarantee that this would elicit the evidence that we're after. Also, some of you may be looking at this and going, God, that would be a bear to grade. So that's also an issue we've got to tangle with. How do you structure a question such that it gives you a, a chance at getting evidence of student knowledge and use, but doesn't give away the farm, doesn't tell them the answer. Also an empirical question. We teach large enrollment classes in large part. And I teach 340 person organic lectures. There's similar size lectures here. The fact of the matter is sometimes selected response questions are a fact of life. Are there ways that they can at least have the potential to give you some evidence that students can use their knowledge? This is another predict the product sort of question. And again, it has a phenomenon. It has a representation that if students know how to use it, should help them arrive at the correct prediction. Uh, and they're asked to predict a product. But again, there's no reasoning component. One way that this can be modified to get out the reasoning is to have a second statement, a second set of things for students to select that entail reasoning about why the prediction is valid. And so students would, would select both a prediction and also reasoning that goes with it. This is nowhere near as strong evidence as having the students themselves construct an explanation or a model because the right answer, of course, is here, and they might just be queuing it from memory by pattern recognition, but it's better than not requesting reasoning at all. So now we've talked about defining critical thinking, a little bit about supporting it, and a little bit about assessing it. I now want to talk about some uses that we've had of this protocol in evaluating the impact of an institutional change effort at Michigan State University. There's a course transformation program that's been ongoing since about 2013, uh, first from a grant by the Association of American Universities, and then later um, a grant from NSF. And the goal here, as I think is similar with the goal of the REACH initiative here at Wisconsin-Madison, is to center instruction more on what we know about how people learn. It's a big team of people, and now we have four different institutions, Michigan State University, Florida International University, Grand Valley State, and Kansas State University. Uh, all of those places are attempting to overhaul intro bio, chem, and physics. That new 2017 grant is now seeking to expand this effort into what we call foundational courses. So these are second year courses, organic chemistry courses, the one that would probably be most familiar to the audience. So the premise behind this transformation effort is that by engaging faculty in intentional discussions regarding what the core ideas are of the discipline, what are these big grain size ideas that should permeate the whole of a curriculum that can be taught at various levels of sophistication and that enable students to predict, explain, and model a whole lot of phenomena? And what do we want students to be able to do with those ideas? 
Those discussions together with something called um, the STEM Teaching and Learning Fellowship, which actually takes us a step further and engages faculty in constructing three-dimensional learning objectives and assessments and analyzing the results from those assessments, that we could get changes in classroom practice and also changes in assessment. It's really important that both of those two things are on the same page. It's a fact of life that a lot of students are motivated by grades. And if you have the world's greatest instruction that's focused on knowledge and use to make sense of phenomena, and all of the points on exams are completely divorced from knowledge and use, students will receive and respond to the message that assessments give them. So it really matters for coherence that these are on the same page. So we want to look at assessments and we want to look at instruction. Since I've already talked quite a bit about the three-dimensional learning assessment protocol, you can guess which one I'm gonna focus on. <laughs> I'm going to focus on it because it's done and because it's actually the easier of the two problems. The three-dimensional learning assessment protocol, however, is informing ongoing development of an observation protocol that gives us a sense as to whether or not instruction has the potential to engage students in knowledge and use. This is a much harder problem because instruction is quite varied, and we want a protocol that's capable of describing biology, chemistry, and physics. There's studio physics. There's bigger and smaller sections of biology, some of which are very much based on group work, some of which are more traditional lecture. So this has proven quite a challenge. The goal of these initiatives is both to measure change over time as we transform courses, but also to help instructors improve, to show them how they might be able to tweak their existing items to elicit evidence of knowledge and use, how they might scaffold those clicker questions they're embedding in their instruction so students see the reasoning behind the answers that they're selecting. We coded a lot of assessments, a lot of assessments from this protocol across Chem, chem 1 and 2, Physics 1 and 2, Bio 1 and 2, so 185 course sections offered, 87 unique instructors, 134 unique exams coded, and a bunch of questions. There are courses like our Gen Chem at Michigan State University that have common exams. If they have common exams, we coded them once. Otherwise, we'd be double counting. Let's take a look at the results. So this is Chem 1 and 2. Each bubble represents a final exam, or if no final exam were available, it represents two or more midterms. The bubble size tells you about the size of the class section. So what you can see is for chemistry, there's a really dramatic shift over the four-year period of this analysis. At the beginning, almost no points were allocated to assessment items that had the potential to engage students in knowledge and use. We have a few pilot sections here where about 50% of the exam items were engaging students in knowledge and use, and then there was a pretty dramatic switch over by year three. I am not saying that all exam questions should require students to use their knowledge to predict, explain, or model phenomena. There are skills that are vitally important to students being able to construct models and use them in any sort of productive way, and those need to be assessed too. I would, however, say that having some emphasis on knowledge and use is really important if we want students to receive and respond to the message that that matters. So what happened here? Well, CLUE, which we've already talked about, was piloted at Michigan State beginning in year one of the project. The pilot grew, and then all of the courses changed over to it. This was facilitated rapidly because Gen Chem at Michigan State University is coordinated by a Gen Chem director and taught largely by academic specialists. If the Gen Chem director was on a particular page, the curriculum could change very quickly. And so Melanie and our director were able to have this happen rapidly, as you can see. This is encouraging one way and potentially troubling in another. What happens if the Gen Chem director changes? That keeps us up at night a little bit. So this is potentially not a very durable transformation because there's not a whole heck of a lot of faculty buy-in involved. Looking now at Bio 1, we see a little bit different story, but we still see a positive trajectory. In year zero, we can see that very, very few exam points are allocated to items that engage students in using their knowledge. Year one, there seem to be some sections that prioritize that. And then year two, there's a few more. There's one way up here. And then year three, we seem to be kind of stable. So we have a bimodal distribution where some have about 45% of the points in the exams dedicated to knowledge and use, and some um, do not. What happened is during year zero of this project, there was something called the Biology Initiative that focused on getting faculty together and coming up with common learning objectives for this biology class. This is cell molecular bio, by the way. Biology is taught by a lot of different faculty 
And even though there was a common list of learning objectives, some followed them and some did not in terms of how they offered their exams. However, the presence of those learning objectives as well as having a central curriculum coordinator does appear to have had a positive impact on more knowledge and use being emphasized on assessments. So it was kind of a happy coincidence that the bio initiative was captured by this analysis. Bio 2, which is organismal and population biology, is a little bit different of a story. You can see the distribution really doesn't change much from year 0 to year 4. And that's because Bio 2 had an earlier project where some core sections were transformed. Those more or less stayed transformed. But the ones that were not transformed, that really didn't emphasize knowledge and use to any great extent, stayed basically the same. You know, this looks really depressing, but it's, it's got a silver lining. So, physics. <laughs> physics at Michigan State University for many, many years and continuing to the present day overwhelmingly emphasizes questions that are randomly generated by a system, and they're math problems, and each student gets a different exam. There's no reasoning emphasized at all. It's not, it's, it's not all that weird. I'll show you in a bit, though, their classes were actually pretty active, despite the assessment emphasis, which gives an incoherent message. So both algebra and calculus-based physics 1 and 2 are represented here. But you may notice there's some outliers way up here. This is a course called P-Cube. This is a studio-based physics course developed by a Center of Physics Education Research at Michigan State University. It emphasizes group work and Problem solving as students make sense of phenomena is almost the sole means of instruction and also assessment. What's really, really cool is in physics, almost all of the faculty rotate through the introductory courses. And so these P-cube sections, which we're just starting here, are growing. And for them to grow, there has to be tremendous faculty buy-in because everyone rotates through them. There's a new STEM instruction building going up at Michigan State with lots of studio classroom space. And it's envisioned that PQ will be the new physics curriculum in a few years' time. So it looks depressing, but in fact, what it represents is the beginning of a transformation that has faculty buy-in and that really will probably be much more durable than the one we have in chemistry. So here's our different stories. We have the fast changeover in chemistry facilitated by central organization and availability of transform resources from the outset. We have Bio 1, where the Bio Initiative allowed some instructors to transform their sections to show evidence of knowledge and use. Bio 2 didn't have much of a change. Some were transformed before and some weren't, and that didn't change. And physics is at the beginning of what I presume will really be an exciting time for students in that course. So I kind of already foreshadowed this, but what is the relationship between the amount of time instructors spend lecturing and their use of three-dimensional assessments? If students are engaged in the most wonderful three-dimensional instructional environment imaginable and they're really just plugging and chugging on their assessments, that's kind of a problem. They're getting some mixed value messages there. Um, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but you can see in Chemistry 1 and 2, those classes that spend a, a smaller percentage of time lecturing also tend to emphasize knowledge and use on assessments. So these are probably about 30% um, of the time lecturing. The same is true more or less in Biology 1 and 2. Here's Physics. Oop, sorry. In physics, you can see that even in classes that only spend 20% of the time lecturing, the assessments do not emphasize knowledge and use at all. So this data was collected by looking at 64 recorded lectures and noting what was going on. And you can see that what was going on in that class was not a whole lot of lecture, but the students probably weren't being engaged in knowledge and use uh, in that environment, and they certainly weren't being assessed on it. So active does not necessarily mean engagement in practices. Talking with the students earlier today about an email chain I'm on where people are really into memorizing like 40 polyatomic ions. There's a set of high school teachers who are like, yeah, that's the thing. And I said, good lord. I mean, you can, yeah, you could actively look at flashcards, but why? What will that help you predict, explain, and model? How will that help you realize the utility of atomic molecular ways of thinking? So in conclusion, the 3D lab can measure change over time as part of a large institutional transformation. Coordinated structured efforts can facilitate this transformation, either ones like the Bio Initiative or like we saw in GenChem. Having ready availability of transformed assets, of transformed curricula and assessments and text narratives that emphasize knowledge and use can also hasten this. 
but reliance on assessment systems that are solely randomized math problems without any reasoning can hinder it. So going forward, we need to finish this bloody observation protocol. <laughs> it's, it's actually, it's really, really hard to get something that characterizes three-dimensional instruction across disciplines. And so we're in the process of finishing validation of that, and we want to use that to characterize how instruction has changed over time. We also ultimately want to determine what supports faculty in emphasizing knowledge and use in their classrooms, what barriers are there, and how can we help faculty surmount them. So I told you it's a talk in two parts. Both are heavily tied to three-dimensional learning, but I'm going to transition now to the high school space because I think this is an area of tremendous need and an area where discipline-based education, research, and chemistry can be really powerful in the lives of a lot of people. So a few of you may have heard of the Next Generation Science Standards. I mentioned them a couple of times earlier. These are standards that derive from the framework for K-12 science education, and they precisely define what students should know and be able to do K-12 in physical science, life science, and earth and space science. This is really a dramatic departure from prior standards, which emphasize stuff you should know and also this thing called inquiry that no one really understood or could measure. So it's really great that we have these precise standards. What's less great, actually, I'll, sorry, I'll say that in a moment. Um, you can see that these standards have been adopted widely. Adoption is a state-by-state -state thing. 19 states in the District of Columbia have adopted the next-gen science standards as is, and 20 states, including Wisconsin, have developed standards based on the framework for K-12 science education. I have to admit to you, I do not know how similar Wisconsin standards are to the NGSS, only that they share the same basis. I'm told there's a new governor coming in that's a little more friendly to education, so maybe all will be well in that regard. But there's a lot of people that are being held to these standards. So let's think about high school chemistry under the next generation science standards. There's several curricula that say that they're aligned, but they also are not very precise about what they mean by aligned. And some of them just put new stickers on old books. Modeling instruction is a curriculum that is centered around the evolution of atomic models. They go through something like two thirds of the um, year with the Thompson model. And the idea is to refine the model as needed to explain new phenomena. But they haven't shown that they're conceptual sequence aligns with specific performance expectations. Chemistry in the Earth system is a project by the state of California to fuse Earth science performance expectations with physical science ones. If any of you have had a look at the standards, the Earth science performance expectations are epic. This is a really tough fusion because they're both very high level and demanding. This is really, for me, the sad bit. So these standards came out in 2013. They've been out for five years. In Michigan, high stakes assessments are currently being developed and they're going to be rolled out in the next year to year and a half. We don't know what they're gonna look like. The previews I've seen are kind of scary. There's no outcomes data that any particular chemistry curriculum prepares students for these ambitious expectations that are different from how the teachers have ever taught or how they learned chemistry. So that means there are thousands of teachers and tens of thousands of students who are kind of freaking out right now. They don't really know what these assessments mean. They don't really know what three-dimensional learning in high school chemistry looks like, how to support it, how to measure it. It's a huge unknown. Recall also that in chemistry, students don't walk in the door with a whole lot of intellectual resources in their toolkit, useful for reasoning about atoms and molecules. Atoms and molecules are counterintuitive. There's a lot of inferences that connect the atomic molecular world to the world that we can see. And there's a whole lot of cool phenomena that are really hard to explain. And if you start instruction with those, even though they might initially prove engaging, students are gonna be able to do little more than describe them. A lot of this is a function of the fact that very few three-dimensional assessments exist for chemistry. And so we cannot evaluate the efficacy of these curricula that claim, that claim alignment because they haven't developed assessments and no one else has either, until now. <laughs> so how should we design learning environments that support three-dimensional learning in chemistry? There is a huge need, there is an immediate need. What can chemistry education research and the undergraduate space tell us about supporting students and in building up their intellectual toolkit? Remember Clue. <laughs> Clue is also based on these progressions of core ideas and students really drawing back as they predict and explain more and more complex phenomena to thinking about energetics and electrostatics and structure properties relationships. This helps calibrate the level that's expected for explanations, predictions, and models. 
That curriculum has shown an ability to support students in making sense of phenomena such as acid-base reactions, emission spectra, phase changes, and several others. So there's a rich literature around that at the undergraduate level. Clue was developed, and I, it sounds like REACH also is employing a backwards design approach, so that's basically what this is, by first thinking about what students should know and be able to do. So this really aligns very much with the performance expectation mindset. Then designing curricula and assessments that both support these expectations and can measure them. And the curricula, as I said, uh, was arrayed around these scaffolded progressions of core ideas. But then you gotta try it. You've gotta actually see if it can support the sort of learning you hypothesize that it can, and then revise in accordance to the data from these assessments. So these cycles of uh, developing hypothetical curricular materials and acting them and revising them have happened for about 10 years. So might this idea of centering instruction around core ideas that are built up as students use their knowledge, so explicitly emphasizing students making these connections themselves and providing evidence that they can, might that help us also in the high school space? We're really creative with how we name things. So, you know. Actually, I don't know how I told this earlier today, but I'm awful at acronyms. Someone was making fun of the REACH acronym, I'm worse. That's high school, so VHSs. Um, so I got together with a team of nine teachers and a couple of researchers, and we sat down and we thought about how what's been assembled under Clue might or might not align with the performance expectations in the next generation science standards for the 9 through 12 grade band in the physical sciences. We clustered the learning objectives under the performance expectations because the NGSS performance expectations are really pretty broad in scope and represent endpoint goals of instruction. So they're not finely grained enough to inform lesson to lesson priorities. Some of them were well fulfilled by existing materials. Some of what's in Clue, because it's an undergraduate course, is far beyond the scope of an intro high school course. And there are some areas where Clue fell short, particularly those performance expectations that emphasize planning and conducting an investigation. Hard to do that in a 340 person lecture hall, which is what Clue was designed for. After we'd done that, we took a look at existing assessments and curricula and we streamlined them to embody the new performance expectations that we elaborated with Clue Learning Objectives. We also integrated things from teachers' experiences that could be used to immerse students in the investigative process. Again, really, really hard to engage students in labs that require sense making in a big class, but it's something you can do in a smaller high school class. These, for this initial 2017 period, uh, were things from teachers' past experiences. They were not designed de novo by the research team, although we're doing that now. We then had some teachers enact these materials and we had some assessments that we deployed. I'm going to focus on one of them for my data analysis the rest of the time. So let's talk a little bit about the pilot. The high school clue data I'm going to share with you is from one teacher's enactments. We had four teachers enact, but really only one that was able to uh, and act in a way that pretty well represented the materials that we assembled. A lot of the teachers had district factors that dramatically impacted the way they were required to implement materials. For instance, we had one that taught the first semester of Gen Chem in ninth grade and the second semester in 11th grade. I don't know why. Turns out that doesn't help learning very much. Um, we had others where there were a lot of common assessments that were very algorithmic and so that too would blunt the impact of the materials that we developed. Um, you can see here that intermolecular forces were introduced in the fall of 2017, and that's also when they were assessed. By traditional, what I mean is a sequence of topics that aligns well with the norms established by Senko and Plain in the late 1950s. So there's been a lot of momentum behind this sequence of topics, and this class aligned with them fairly well. This also was an honors class, I should add that you can see that intermolecular forces were introduced in fall of 2017 and we didn't administer our assessment until the spring of 2018. This is because we had a really hard time finding a traditional cohort. However, there were topics that really should heavily leverage the conceptual resources underpinning intermolecular forces that were late in the game in the traditional course. Solutions foremost among them. So hopefully it wouldn't um, distort our data too much, but that is a limitation. Recall that modeling instruction is a curriculum that is sequenced according to the evolution of atomic models. So we have 100 students who are enrolled in that curriculum. They don't get to intermolecular forces till near the end of the course, and that's when they were assessed. Q 
who enrolled undergraduates can serve as kind of an upper anchor of what would be at all reasonable to expect of high school students. And in fact, it's probably unreasonable to expect this of high school students because these folks have had at least two chemistry courses. However, there here is a point of comparison. This was given as an end of course assessment to the clue enrolled undergraduates. However, um, as I've said before, forces and energy are a recurring spiral theme throughout the curriculum. And so we know they had to think about these things pretty recently, even relative to the end of the course. So here's the assessment item. Students are asked to consider why two things that have the same formula and the same molecular mass have different boiling points. So dimethyl ether is a gas at room temperature and ethanol the liquid. They're first asked to draw and label a representation that indicates where hydrogen bonding is present for three molecules of ethanol. You may remember that from just a bit ago. This is to give us some evidence that they understand that these are forces between molecules. They're then asked to use the representation of hydrogen bonding they drew to explain why the ability of ethanol to form hydrogen bonds results in it having a higher boiling point than dimethyl ether. The reason why we said explain why the ability of ethanol to hydrogen bond in this sentence is that if we neglected that, students are all just going to say, because ethanol can hydrogen bond. And we wanted more than that. We wanted them to say the attractive interactions between ethanol molecules are stronger than those between dimethyl ether molecules, and so it takes more energy to disrupt them. Remember, I talked about explicitly tying things back to core ideas. Those are two of them, electrostatic and bonding interactions and energy. Let's look at the first one first. As before, these can be coded as one of three things, between, within, or a code that we actually change when we analyze the data. So there weren't many that were correct Lewis structures that were ambiguous. There were, however, a lot of students who couldn't draw Lewis structures at all. This person blew up ethanol into some weird radical thing and then drew dotted lines between them. <laughs> Given this, I am not comfortable drawing any inferences about how they understand intermolecular forces. They don't know the skill needed to draw the model. So that's why we created this new bin. I should also highlight the fact that between means they drew these interactions between molecules, not that they drew them correctly. Most of them did draw them correctly, but this example didn't, and that's because I wanted to highlight this. Let's use my awesome zoom in function. You can see that there's a partial positive on a hydrogen bonded to a carbon. That is not right, uh, but it is drawn. These forces are drawn as between molecules, so this was coded as between. This was not common, but it's something I should say because it's one of the rules for our coding scheme. Okay. So, as before, about 75% of the clue enrolled undergraduates drew intermolecular forces, drew hydrogen bonds as between molecules. That's good. We've replicated it again. Hooray. About 54% of the high school clue students did likewise. You can see about a third of them did draw hydrogen bonds as covalent bonds. And we had about 10% that were uh, drawing non-normative structures. I should mention that when we do this coding, we scramble up all the data. And then I and another coder um, code that we think the drawings represent, and we continue jointly coding until we reach uh, Cohen's cap of about 0.7. It's usually a percent agreement around 80%. Cohen's cap is a little more robust way of measuring inter-rater reliability because it takes into account the likelihood that we just agree by chance. So we weren't biased by the fact that we want the high school clue students to do well. That's, that's why I say that. So uh, the modeling students had a little difficulty. About a quarter of them had the non-normative Lewis structures, and I don't want to focus on all the things kids can't do, but some of these were pretty gnarly. Um, I'm not going to put them up there. About 52% of those students drew hydrogen bonds as covalent bonds within molecules. It looks like the traditional students, though, were about comparable to the high school clue students. About 50% of them drew hydrogen bonds as between molecules. Keep that in your head. We're going to come back to it in just a little bit. Let's look at the explanation now. This is kind of where the rubber meets the road. So that first one has to do with representing these forces. But can students really explain this difference in properties by leveraging their understanding of core ideas? There are four codes that we use to describe this data set. And the coding was done as I just described, which is to say we scrambled up all the data, coded about 25%. And when we got to an inner rate of reliability of 0.7 Cohen's kappa, then um, only one person coded the remainder. You can get the code of hydrogen bonding if you basically restate the question. This, this is you saying, oh, ethanol can hydrogen bond, so that's why. Hydrogen bonding and strength of interactions was given as the code when students explicitly invoke the relative strength of the interactions between ethanol molecules and dimethyl ether molecules. They had to say something comparative, so stronger or strongest. They couldn't just say, because hydrogen bonds are strong. 
But what we really wanted was for students to say, the reason ethanol has a higher boiling point than dimethyl ether is because the interactions are stronger and so it takes more energy to disrupt them. The fourth code is non-normative. And non-normative in this instance very often meant that students just vaguely used the word bonds. <laughs> Past evidence has shown, and a number of studies have shown, that when students vaguely say bonds, they almost never mean intermolecular forces. They often don't know what they mean, but it's rare that they mean intermolecular forces. And so if there was nothing in their response that cued us in to their meaning IMFs, then it was coded as non-normative. There were also other random and accurate crazy things that got in that same bit. So let's take a look. 63% of the clue enrolled undergraduates said something about strength of interactions, and 55% of those explicitly invoked energy. This is kind of exciting. Energy is one of the core ideas we want students to be leveraging when they're discussing these sorts of, sim of systems. And it's not explicitly prompted for, as you can see. 67% of the high school clue enrolled students also mentioned strength of interactions. And bear in mind, the fact they're in this category means it was clear to us they met intermolecular forces, which is kind of cool. A little over half of those students explicitly invoked energy. The modeling enrolled students overwhelmingly offered non-normative explanations. As I said, we scrambled the data set when we coded. So this is not bias um, on behalf of us wanting the high school clue students to do better. The same is true of the traditionally taught students. We would hope that there is a relationship between students who draw interactions between molecules and those students' ability to describe boiling in terms of disruption of forces between molecules. And indeed, for high school clue, there is such an association. That is, you can predict how likely a student is to give a reasonable explanation, so either hydrogen bonding, hydrogen bonding strength of interactions, or hydrogen bonding strength and energy, by whether they drew a, the forces as between molecules. There, however, is no association for modeling or traditional. Remember, the traditional enrolled students drew hydrogen bonding as between molecules in the same percentage as the high school clue. But they really struggled with the explanation. And this may indicate that that is a disconnected skill in their minds. That is, hydrogen bond drawing is something they know the rules of the game for, but it's not necessarily something that they can explain or use to make sense of phenomena. So in conclusion, uh, this is very, very preliminary. But centering instruction around core idea progressions appears to help the students that we've looked at understand properties in terms of molecular scale interactions. These ways of thinking, these scientific practices, they take practice. They involve slowing down and considering what you know about core ideas and how it can help you make sense of something you're confronted with. That's not a natural thing. The obvious limitation is this data derives from four teachers' enactments. This is really preliminary stuff. But as I said, there is nothing published in terms of outcome data on high school chemistry to supporting three-dimensional learning at this point. We also cannot know how representative modeling and traditionally taught cohorts are of that class of, of classes in general. And in fact, there's probably tremendous heterogeneity in those sorts of classes. So we've got to be careful here. We can't really generalize much at this point. Also, the students in those classes may well have had the intellectual resources to answer these sorts of questions, but not know that we were asking for them. It's a possibility, and we, ha we have to own up to that as a limitation. So I'm really excited to uh, say that we got together with a, a subset of 11 teachers this past summer, and we thought about both the data I just presented and some more data that I didn't have time to present, and refine materials further, this time also integrating opportunities for students to make sense of phenomena and project-based experiences where they're presented with something they don't really understand, they come up with initial models and refine them in response to data. Right now, there are 11 teachers in five states that are implementing this curriculum. We're getting data back from all of them right now. That's 1,100 or so students, which is really exciting to me. We have weekly logs that ask teachers what's happening, what triumphs have they had, what issues have they had, what are they using of the materials that we've assembled? If they're changing things, why are they changing things? We don't say don't change things. I can't, with any evidence, claim that the way that we've assembled stuff from our four enactments last year is gonna work perfectly everywhere and that it's the optimal way to do things. What I can do is take careful stock of the modifications that teachers make and triangulate that with the assessment data we have access to and hopefully get a window into which modifications are 
possible or permissible or even maybe enhance the efficacy of the curriculum in which modifications are maybe best avoided. We also have a series of four assessments going out. All of these are multi-part, and so we have a lot of data coming in. Um, and we have a, a subset of comparison teachers from the same area, actually from the same schools as our high school clue teachers. So this should support more robust comparisons. Uh, in future, of course, we want more outcomes data for more context. We want to create and integrate these project-based opportunities and get evidence that students enrolled in this curriculum can and do make sense of phenomena in a way that is valuable to them. We want to have evidence that they're talking amongst themselves about what's going on and why it's going on and figuring out is the way they're approaching the activity, not just school science. This last bit's really important for me maintaining my sanity. Um, we're going to have like, you know, 11, if we, if we scale this up, we have about 1,100 students right now. With the comparison teachers, we're looking at maybe 1,500 responses to assessment items. That, that one has actually three parts. I only showed you two of them today. Many of these have three or four parts. We need to find a way to train machine learning algorithms to help us automate some of this coding and give us population level data on student understanding in these contexts. What would be wonderful is if we could provide that to teachers in more or less real time so we could get a heat map of efficacy and teachers could know whether the modifications they're making are impacting student understanding. We're closer to this than you might think. There's a program at Michigan State called the Automated Analysis of Constructed Response. And in fact, for one of our assessments, we're, we're quite close to a working predictive model that will enable automated population level coding. So it has reliability with human coding of about 80% agreement, kappa 0.7-ish. So it's not suitable for individual feedback because it's going to be wrong like 20% of the time. But for population level feedback, it's still really valuable because there's a lot of nuance embedded in these codes. Um, I'd like to thank, so some of you may recognize the doodle. So, so I got sent this last night by my friend and colleague, Aaron Duffy. Um, this is our group, and I'd like to thank all of them. Um, I would like to thank Melanie for being a wonderful and supportive mentor. She'd never done anything in K-12 before this, and I just came in and went, hey, I just got back from the academy, and there's like this huge need, and I want to do this. And she's like, okay, go for it. Um, this is the team involved with High School Clue. Debbie Harrington's at Grand Valley. Robbie's an undergrad who wants to be a teacher. He's a phenomenal undergrad. And you already saw that the three-dimensional learning team is massive. So with that, I'm happy to take any questions.